Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really delighted to welcome you to this, our third installment of three in a series we've been delighted to run at the IIA with the European Parliament Liaison Office in Dublin. I'll be able to introduce our expert panel today who are going to discuss the future of work and the effects of digitalization on the lives of citizens across the EU and indeed beyond. And we'll be, we'll be focus, focusing specifically in part on the role of the European Parliament in this regard. My name is Barry Colfer, and I am the Director of Research here at the IIA in Dublin, and I'm delighted to introduce our panel. So joining me in discussion today, we have Deirdre Clune, Member of the European Parliament for Ireland South, and George Cabrita, Research Manager in the Working Life Unit at Eurofound the European Foundation for the Improvement of Living and Working Conditions in Europe. Eurofound are a neighbour here in Dublin, one of the very first EU agencies that was established shortly after Irish accession, and we're delighted to have this opportunity to renew and indeed strengthen our relations with Eurofound. On the subject of today's discussion, it's difficult really to think of a topic of more centrality to people's lives, perhaps beyond their health and their family, than the world of work. I always think typically when we speak of someone, aside from when they lived and where they were from, the first data point we often think about is how they occupy themselves, what they worked at and what they did. What's more, many workers, as we know, we tend to spend more time with work colleagues than with family or friends, uh, which obviously works out very well for, uh, for most people, um, certainly for myself and my dear colleagues. Mm -hmm. Yet the world of work is evolving and not for the first time. With the technological revolutions driven by forces including digitalization, microprocessing, artificial intelligence, and other forms of technological advancements that have radically transformed tasks, jobs, and indeed entire professions. And not to mention public employment service offerings and the ways that skills are obtained, retained, and updated. And of course, as we're going to hear today from our speakers, the legacy of COVID still lingers. And indeed, questions about what makes a good quality job now, I think, are more, uh, more and more discussed following the, the disruption of the pandemic. Finally, given that this is the European Year of Skills, it just feels a very appropriate point at which to conclude this round of collaboration with the EPLO in Dublin on the subject of the future of work and the effects of digitalization. Our panelists will each speak for seven to 10 minutes. I'll then give our speakers a chance to discuss anything that has been said between them before opening the floor for questions and answers with you, our audience, and I will moderate the questions for our speakers. You'll be able to join the discussion as ever using the Q&A function on Zoom, and please send any questions in throughout the session, and we'll come to as many of them as we can. A reminder that today's presentation and questions and answers are both on the record, and you can join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We're also live streaming this afternoon's discussion, so a very warm welcome to all of you joining in via YouTube. I'll now formally introduce our speakers before first handing over to Deirdre and then to George. Deirdre Clune is a member of the European Parliament for Ireland South, having been elected in 2014 and re-elected in 2019. She's a member of the Fine Gael Party, which sits with the European People's Party Group in the EP, the largest group in Parliament. Her role as an MEP, in her role as an MEP, Deirdre is a full member of the Parliament's Committee on Internal Market and Consumer Protection, or IMCO Committee, and is a substitute member of the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, or ENVI Committee. Previous to her work in the European Parliament, Deirdre was an engineer and a local authority representative in Cork City and at the national level in both houses of the Oireachtas, the Irish Parliament. For our second speaker, we're delighted to welcome George Cabrita. George is Research Manager in the Working Life Unit of Eurofound, the European Foundation for the Improvement of Working and Living Conditions, which, as I say, is based here in Dublin. In this role, George is responsible for formulating, coordinating and managing European-wide studies, surveys, publications in the, in the thematic areas of working conditions and industrial relations. George joined Eurofound as a research officer in 2009 and has been a research manager since 2016. Prior to joining Eurofound, George worked in various economic and social research institutes in Portugal. Colleagues, thank you very much for being with us. And I hand the floor first to Deirdre. Me. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Barry. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the future of work, um, 
what it means, the digitalization, I suppose, is a very broad subject, but no doubt, absolutely, we've seen, we've got some insight in the last years with COVID on um, the value of digitalization, uh, not just in the workforce, but I suppose in could be said to bring bring us together and what it allowed for people to in their own homes to contribute and to share and to, to be involved in their communities in their workforce as well and suddenly I even found here in the European Parliament um, I'm in Brussels as we speak and uh, we were overnight able to vote <laughs> in our homes just print off your vote ballot paper sign it and that was it whereas previously and still now we have to be uh, in presence but but I think um, it's shown uh, it's, it's shown up in other things. It's, it's, shown, it's really, um, if you like, leap, leap, taken leap forward in digitalization and workplace. It's also uh, exposed probably a, a level of skills uh, that, that we don't have and that we could have uh, and that we should have. So um, that's the question that we've seen. I mean, the pl place of work and how we work, where we work, there's been a lot of discussion around it. I've seen, I just, I'm finishing, a file, dealing with the file at the moment myself on artificial intelligence and what it means, digitalization. We're seeing absolutely changes in the kind of work and what, what, what it will mean for the workplace. It's been described uh, as, as um, another uh, major revolution, like into the Industrial Revolution. I don't know if we're in the middle of that. I don't know. But I, all I know is we have to uh, steer with steer it and go, go with it at the moment. And um, it's, we've, we're dealing with legislation. Looking at looking at artificial intelligence in the area of the workplace as well, and that if if it is if it's there for if you're using it for um, uh, or to employ people, uh, then that has to be made. You have to make people aware of it that they are being that that, that their CVs are being scanned by by artificial intelligence. But at the same time, so that that is a high risk area, so you have to to register that. But at the same time, then I think you can see the value of artificial intelligence if we look at the area of bias. If, for instance, that if you have if you control the data and make sure that you try and eliminate data as best you can, bias as best you can from the data, well then you can have a good result. But anyway, but I think we're here to talk about um, what 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 will it mean? I think it will mean um, it, it there there are certainly tech digitalization, new technologies, they are generating absolutely uh, new forms of employment, uh, a new concept of work, and it's a challenge to us and to our labor markets. And uh, even when you look at the limits, the rules on um, of labor law, social protection, when it comes to uh, when it comes to what we call platform workers, those working in the gig economy, uh, what does it mean for them? Uh, that those, we need to have questions for that, answers for that and recognize um, that uh, workers have an important have still have an important role in our society and, and that needs needs to be protected and then uh, the benefits of it i would think are absolutely more flexible work more imaginative more adaptable forms of empl employment i even see uh, myself now you know i can't make a meeting i can't be physically present but i can actually contribute remotely i think that's been of enormous benefit we've seen for more and more uh, in the workplace people are uh, not not necessarily going in for the five days a week, but going in for three. And I think, you know, that that kind of flexibility has been of enormous benefit to people. It's a challenge for employers to make sure that uh, they get that, that right balance. But I've so often I hear now from individuals that if they're going for a job, particularly my own family as well, if it doesn't allow for flexible work or, or doesn't allow for time to work from home, they're not interested in the job. So I think employers will be changing as well with their employees or with the potential potential employees and how they they see so um they're, they're exp and obviously digitalization is creating new more new types of work new jobs and education and training uh, and um we need to make sure that uh, we have the skills for that it will require uh, two types of skilling to say upskilling which is to, uh, the existing staff have to gain new skills and that's um we see that a lot in the, in the workforce uh, employers are doing that but also reskilling uh, and that's where individuals employees have been left behind because they don't have the necessary skills and that's really really important we focus that 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 would be a uh, really part of um of of our work we're doing it here in the parliament as well this is a european this is european years of skills and what does that mean it means we have to focus on bringing everybody with us and not just people in young people studying but it's older people and, and and in between people and women who want to get back into the workforce or those who've lost the, who've lost the job or find that they're in a transition phase they need to be supported and with the necessary skills then they can participate in the this the skills um they can participate 
in the employment sector. So uh, I think it's in, in, interesting to watch. Uh, every year the, the Commission produces its economy, the Digital Society and Economy in, Index. And Ireland does quite well in that, looks at various factors across the board, uh, looks at skills, well, looks at um, issues like integration of digital technology, public services, human capital, connectivity. When you look at the skills, um, we do have, uh, compared to other countries, quite a high level of basic digital content creation skills. Uh, so we are, we're good in that. And um, we were behind in high, higher level ICT specialists and enterprise providing IC tra tra training. I'm looking at that over the last number of years, but last year we were com coming up there. And particularly when you look at um, women with um, I ICT skills, we, we, are, we do quite well. We're number one, we're number one in, in Europe for that. Now, it's not a, I'd like to see it stronger. We're not in a desirable position. I think it probably gives you more of an insight into how uh, the rest of Europe is in, in, in the, when we don't focus enough on, on getting women into, into the STEM, into, the, into studying the, the STEM subject, science, technology, engineering, and maths, and actually working in that area, particularly in the ICT area. We need to do more of it because, um, you know, you need to look where you're, where are we going to get the new workforce for the, I reckon there's a lot of it in, in, in uh, a lot of talent there with our females and, and we're going to have, a, there is a skills shortages at the moment in many areas. Uh, that's one of the reasons we do have the European years of skills this year, uh, 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 targeting to get seven, six million uh, people to be upskilled this year, 2023. So we'll see what the measurement of that brings. But I think it, it, it's, it's important. It's one of the areas we recognize that skills, skill shortages, and, and I mean, we hear it from employers all the time. They need more, uh, more of those skills. And are they going to, is, will, will, is that's a question for immigration as well for a lot of our other European mm -hmm. member states. Um, uh, so we do have, a, a, is we want to see part in the parliament skills agenda, ensure that people and businesses can take full advantage of those technological development advancements and where they're going to go. Uh, uh, we need, uh, and we need this this concept of lifelong learning. No longer is what you gain in your schooling or your first entry into the third level sector or your diploma, whatever course you may have after schooling. No longer is that just enough. You have to be, and I think we're seeing it more and more that um, lifelong learning is important. And remote working, you know, because we've got remote working now again, connectivity is important there. Ireland does fare quite well in that. Uh, we're actually overall in Europe in terms of the, dig the digital society index. We're number five, which is uh, which is good. But we should keep striving to be number one and number one plus, in my view. Um, uh, so, in what what you are the, one of the topics is what can European Parliament do? Well, we've had uh, a lot of focus, as I say, on looking at looking at. Um, gig workers and those working in the uh, in the sharing economy area and um, you know I, I recognize there's a balance here that people want to work in that they like the flexibility of it like the turn up when they choose element of it but then many people find that it, it's we're moving moving towards a contract only you know pay pay for what you work and no support and services around that so that needs the area we need we need just need greater clarity around platform working uh, and uh, structures within member states to establish social security protection for those people uh, in a way that they can contribute should, should they want to. But I think it, that's important. Um, the Work-Life Balance Directive has been enacted 2019. So we're now um, almost three years into that. And since it was enacted, and that I think was really important at OSA uh, Work-Life Balance. It's not just about the female participants are those who have is also about parent fa fathers or the parent of the child as well in terms of when talking about child care that they would be involved i think it's been the introduction of parental leave paternity leave maternity leave have all been very beneficial they've sent a message to people to those workers whether male or female that it's important society wants you to work once you have children, once you to work, it's and we're going to support you in those times. So I think that those provisions are very welcome. And I think at one point you didn't have uh, maternity leave available in every member state. So um, the fact that we've moved from maternity leave now to paternity leave, uh, I don't think we can underestimate the importance of that. And of course, they're going with that then is the cost of childcare and uh, supporting parents with with the childcare costs because I would say it's not forever that the children will be young and uh, baby, babies or infants. And I'm sure I hope I'm speaking to many people who are struggling with that at the moment. We all did our struggles, 
uh, but to have support in that because it's a very short time and suddenly they're going to school and they're you know it becomes the burden become is reduced of, of the burden of childcare. So uh, I think they're very important aspects of developing and creating a, a, an ecosystem whereby people can feel comfortable in work and that work doesn't shouldn't dominate your life. It's a really, really, as you said, Barry, it's a really important element of your life. It's probably where you make your most friends. You spend a lot of your daytime with people. Uh, but then we do have uh, lives outside that as well. I need to recognize that. At work, the other question probably would be coming up would be working week. Should it be four day week? Um, I don't know that some such as that maybe that suits others it won't uh, but I think um, uh, you know we've seen as well like I mean and it came up in a discussion we had this week about artificial intelligence that uh, the area it's going to in workplace it's going to, probably the areas the sectors is tourism uh, insurance and uh, accountancy and then the legal sector as well where it will take a lot of the of the uh, what was the word can I use donkey word? I don't know the well the, the basic the, the regular work out would leave more time for creativity uh, and then in, in, improve productivity. So it's about the quality of work rather than the quantity of the work. So they can be the advantages, but then uh, what does it mean downstream for or what does it mean for uh, jobs that are displaced? I think the solution there is upskilling or reskilling. So um, I think I, the kind of the points I wanted to touch on, I'm sure in the discussion we'll get get to more more areas. Um, uh, but generally, you know, uh, I think we have to digitalization. I would say is here with us. We have to uh, not run away from it, not ban it, uh, but it, it's there. It's important. It's making lives easier for people. But we've got to be really careful that we don't leave anybody behind, and uh, that that our workforce is prepared. For the future, those that are currently in work that can be upskilled, and that, those that need to be, need need reskilling, they're very very that's very important. So thanks so much, Deirdre. There, there are several things you said that I'd be really keen to to discuss with you, but I'm going to wait. I'll hold my wish until George has finished his okay. uh, his remarks. But I'll also say I'm I'm delighted to have been uh, I've been able to avail of two weeks of paternity leave recently, Good. and <laughs> it is it's it's a relatively new phenomenon in Ireland as we know, and actually. It's really, it was really fundamental to have those two weeks at home with my with my family. And if I didn't have them, uh, I would have really missed out on something, you know, and I wouldn't have known if I hadn't had the opportunity. So it is a really important and a fundamental shift, I think, in, in the way we organize our work. And I would say that that makes you more content in your work because you have that balance, you know, you, you, don't, much. Feel, you don't feel cheated from the time at home that you should have had with the baby, but you feel that you, you know, you can approach work with a more positive exactly. mental attitude. I hope. Speaking for, for parents everywhere, I hope. Uh, George. Yeah. Over to you, please. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, again, uh, big thanks to the, the organizers of, uh, of this event for, for having us. Uh, uh, my colleague, Barbara Gessenberger, was supposed to be here today, but unfortunately, she's not able. So uh, her apologies, and uh, I'll try to uh, uh, do my best to uh, fill in uh, her her uh, participation. So basically, I would like to make a few points um, which stem from um, recent research and from some some thinking that we have been doing recently around uh, the future of work and more specifically about uh, the, the digital future of, 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 of work. So one of the things that we know is um, that no one has a crystal ball uh, mm -hmm. to know exactly what the future of work will look like. But there are a few things that we are certain about. Uh, and I would like to highlight some of those uh, things which we so, some of us call them drivers. And there are four of them. Them. Uh, three of them I'll go kind of um, uh, rather briefly and then I'll spend a little bit more time on the last one which is about technological change and so closer to the discussion we are having today. The first of those drivers is that I would like to underline is um, this idea of re-globalization and geopolitics. So at the moment we are in this circumstances uh, of, of, of being in the middle of a poly crisis. So we are in the middle of many different changing events. So we have climate change, we had the COVID-19 pandemic, we have the invasion of Ukraine, we had Brexit, lots of convulsions and crises happening at the same time. And this is basically questioning the way we, that we structure our economies and our societies. And uh, actually at European level, there's some rethinking about the strategic autonomy of the European Union actually as a whole, right? So there's a few decisions taken there into, which affect uh, may affect fair trade, uh, protectionism, etc. And this will also have an um, impact on our economies, our employment structures and, and working conditions. So uh, just to 
contextualize a little bit uh, and and to say that the digital transformation and the way that work will look into the future is not only dependent on the digital the digital but also other aspects and this reglobalization is certainly one of them the second aspect which is also very important and i believe derdra um touched upon it uh, it's the demographic demographic change so uh, there are a few long standing trends so we 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 see increased life expectancy we see a decrease in the number of births uh, our population uh, population is aging and quite quite uh, rapidly and and therefore our workforce as well so there's an increased dependency rate between those who are at work and those who are not at work um but there are also some conjunctural trends, such as EU immigration. So uh, given the, the circumstance of Brexit, for example, people, EU um, citizens going back to their countries. Uh, and we have also non-EU migration with uh, some fluxes f coming from uh, many parts of the world and refugees from uh, conflict areas and, and, and so on and so forth. But this kind of will ask uh, some questions about the way that we organize our work, namely to what extent work our workplaces are ready to include and to cater for a diverse workforce. So this diversity is increasing very fast. It's very likely that we increase even further in the future, even as a way of dealing with um, uh, labor shortages, which have been mentioned already by, by Derdre. So this idea of sustainability of working conditions and the protection of the most vulnerable is certainly part of this conversation of this need for inclusion as well in this uh, big change, uh, which is the demographic one. So if we move on to the third one, which is also very important, it's uh, we, we, we have the greening, the, the climate change, which is happening at, this, at, at, at the same time, and we are kind of feeling it. So there's more frequent and larger scale extreme weather events, wildfires, heat waves, floods, droughts, everything happening uh, more intensely and faster and uh, with higher frequency all across the borders in uh, uh, our uh, European Union. And this will have an impact on working conditions as well. So especially for those people working outdoors, for example, this will mean some transformations and some changes will have to take place. Um, at the same time, we will have to uh, implement some uh, climate policies, adaptation policies, mitigation policies, and we have the European Green Deal, which is this big plan, the path towards a carbon neutral society in Europe by 2050. And this will have incredible uh, effects uh, on our economies and uh, our employment structures. There will be um, um, great transformations in this respect. Some jobs will be destroyed, other new jobs will be created, and many jobs uh, will be transformed by this transformation. And um, this one, um, this this climate change and this transition to a carbon neutral economy is very tied to the digital transition as well. And th that's why some of us talk about the twin transition. So uh, there's this intent of bringing digital and green together and try to find the sweet spot between these two types of, of trans transformation. And this leads me to the the last of my four, let's say, major drivers affecting the future of, of work, and that's technological change. So Deirdre already mentioned the number of uh, aspects related to this. It's a fa very fast paced change. So this is kind of every day uh, we basically blink and there's something new uh, coming up in, in our lives. Uh, and this affects our work uh, as well. We talk about automation, platformization, digitization of services, uh, there's already talks about 6G, there's 3D printing happening, there's Internet of Things, there's so many uh, different uh, concepts and things happening at the same time, which are permeating our lives and our work uh, as well. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, as well, in general, and in, in particular, its application to the workplace, it uh, certainly will implicate. Um, it will drive some, some changes uh, in terms of the nature of some of the work because not all work will be transformed by AI, but some work will be for sure. And then the way we allocate the tasks uh, and the way that we monitor and assess performance uh, at work will be certainly affected as well by, by AI. So there's a number of consequences there um, which we have to keep an eye on and uh, certainly open for, for discussion. And apart from artificial intelligence, something which uh, the Deirdre mentioned, which is remote work, and we know a little bit more about this because we have been doing quite a lot of research on, on the topic, 
And I would like to dwell a little bit about the, the benefits and, and challenges of, of, remote, of remote work. So we, we, we have seen that there was a boom of, of teleworking during the pandemic. And in the wake of, of the pandemic, there's a lot of conversation about this idea of hybrid work. Should people return to the offices full time? Are we allowed to work flexibly and choose the, the, the location of our work? Um, and these are conversations that need to be informed as well. And there's a few things that our research is, is showing is that on the one hand, those people doing remote work, they tend to long uh, to work longer hours. Mm -hmm. They tend to report a greater work intensity. So when they are left to their own devices, um, there's some sort of... Um, uh, negative impacts, let's say, uh, stemming from, from this. Then in terms of work-life balance, some people say it's beneficial, but others find it a challenge. So sometimes it's not very easy for them, even working remotely, to uh, uh, reconcile their, their uh, private and family lives with, with their work. Then the aspects of creativity and innovation, which are also very important for, for, for uh, the, the workplaces, it's an expected benefit. But some people are arguing that actually remote work is kind of curtailed this potential to uh, creativity and innovation that sometimes uh, arises from uh, direct interaction at the, at, the, at the office, for example. Then there's obviously the discussion about commuting, transport systems, etc. So the time and cost savings that come with less commute on the one hand, but at the same time, we, this raises questions about the way that we are organizing our cities and the way we organize our transports and uh, the services that uh, are part of our, our, of our lives and our families. So childcare is just one of those examples and we have to uh, integrate those things in, in, in our equation. And then finally, this, there's this sense of potential inequalities between those people that can telework because not all jobs are teleworkable and those people in jobs which are non-teleworkable. So things like uh, career progression, for example, the fact they don't they don't interact so much with their managers or uh, supervisors, there might be some um, uh, differences there, and uh, we have to think about also these kind of inequalities that may arise from the promotion of this kind of work. But in the end, and uh, I don't want to spend much more time, and uh, just to send a final message from from our side is. Um, it's about job quality, okay? So it's about the quality of the jobs that we have at the moment, that we will create in the future in the transitions I mentioned, uh, and to ensure that we make jobs more attractive. So some of the jobs... Um, some sectors such as, for example, uh, the, the, the healthcare sector or the long-term care sectors, they are suffering from very severe labor shortages. And we are studying those sectors at the moment. And the jobs in those sectors, unfortunately, have a, a re relatively low job quality in comparison with average or with other groups of workers. So one of the ways of improving the attractiveness of these jobs is actually by improving the job quality of, of, of these jobs. And then, of course, there's the role uh, of these uh, of, of job quality in supporting the transitions so this is linked to works health, to workers health and well-being so by having better job quality we have better health and well-being reported by uh, workers and also more engagement uh, better job quality implies more engagement with all the consequences that brings both for the, the workers, but also for their employers and their organizations. And there's a type of organization, the so-called learning organizations, which are more likely to promote these links. And uh, that's a, a kind of discussion that we can have as well, which is how do we organize our companies, our organizations, and what kind of uh, things are more important to drive us uh, into uh, the future. And then just to conclude, so, in order to achieve our desired future with uh, an engaged, uh, an adaptable, a skilled and resilient workforce in the jobs where workers are needed the most, we need high quality jobs. This is one certainty for sure in uh, very uncertain times at the moment. And I, I would stop here for the moment and happy to discuss further. Thanks. Thank you so much, George and Deirdre. So much to work with there. And I'm going to go through a couple of things that I'm thinking about now from, from your presentations and then turn over to the audience. Um, just a, a really general one for you, George, to begin with. I have my own idea of, of what a good quality job is. It's probably mm -hmm. different to what, to what you and what Deirdre and anyone else would think. Um, can you just describe, like, what, what sort of language do you use when describing uh, a, a job being of good quality or not? And kind of what are the objective ways of measuring that? 
Absolutely. Uh, uh, with great pleasure, actually, because that's that's uh, something that we have been working on for, for many, many years. So uh, uh, we know that some aspects of, of our jobs, of our working mm -hmm. conditions, are intimately related to our health and well-being. We know that uh, if we think in simple terms, we have two types of, of things at work. You have job demands and you have job resources. If you have job demands, job demands are things that require effort from you, okay? The amount of work that you have to do, the effort that you have to put in, either physical or emotional, those are things that are required from you. The, the schedule that you have, if you have to work nights or weekends or shifts, mm -hmm. all of these may have different impacts on your health and well-being, okay? So the more job demands that you have, the more likely is that your work will impact negatively on your health and well-being. And then you have the other side of the coin, which are the job resources. Those are the things that give you tools to address the job demands that you get. This is not a zero sum, so it's kind of it's something it's not that liquid, let's say. But the fact is that the more job resources you have, the more engaged you will be, and a positive uh, implications you will have for your health and well-being. So, for example, if you have social support from your manager and from your colleagues at work, you are much more likely to be engaged on your job than someone who doesn't get that sort of support. And support is kind of just on your daily basis, you know, to get. Uh, some support when it uh, is needed. So uh, uh, a job with, with good quality is a job with the minimum required job demands to perform the work that needs to be performed and to the highest level of, with the highest level of job resources possible for that, for that job. So a good uh, quality job is a job that actually promotes health and well-being of, of workers that would be uh, the definition uh, of course then i can go in more detail but this we are talking about dozens of different variables the, the, the different uh, dimensions and so on i just gave a few uh, examples very very there. interesting I'll, I'll invite you you deirdre to, to comment yeah. or respond to anything that george says in a moment and vice versa george but just something that i'm thinking about is i do think about this a lot like everybody does and i'm absolutely sure that like what i would and this makes this a fun thing to research i think but I think my attitude towards the things you've described changes across my life cycle. Uh, I, th I think when I was younger, when I was in my 20s, the things that kind of motivated me to go to work, the social aspect, the kind of learning aspect, it's probably different now in my late 30s, the sorts of things that I would kind of value and that would have a positive it, or negative it, effect on my health. I don't know, if, is that factored into your research at all? The kind of it, it, it is, it is. And our research, uh, the things that we try to keep in, in our modeling, if you wish, it's the objective things. Mm. It's so we try to to keep the the subjective part uh, uh, away as much as possible. There are things that we know are detrimental to your health. If you work long hours for a sustained period of time over time, that will absolutely have a negative impact on your health, mm. either you like it or not. If you, uh, for example, if you are poorly rewarded for your job. So if you have the feeling that you're not well paid for the job that you do, despite the efforts that you put in, this will have a negative impact on your health, either you like it or not. These are objective measurements of things which determined, on the one hand, determined your job quality, and at the same time, uh, will have an impact on your health and well-being, right? Okay. The things that you were talking about are about preferences. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you measure those things, so for example, work-life balance is something that we don't include in our modeling exactly because of that, because work-life balance means different things for different people at different stages of their lives. If they're students, if they're young parents, if they are, you know, at the later stage of their lives, work-life balance means different things. So that we keep it outside of our, yeah. The modeling, cool. Deirdre, I was going to come back on a couple of things that you said, but I'd like to invite you. Do you want to say anything to what George said in his intervention? There's no, no, no I think but... it's interesting. And I just, I, I was, one of the points I wanted to raise as well was about um, when mental health and are we seeing more stress in the workplace now? Mm. Do you have that? Because I, I, you spoke about quality jobs and obviously being job, I think the word job satisfaction is important mm. as well, that you're happy doing the work you're doing, you feel you're contributing. And I would think that somewhere along the line too that remuneration and what you've been paid for the job is really is really important has to be and, and you mentioned that you're just uh, do we see like i know we hear a lot of post-covid and people are under more pressure more stress uh that the workplace is, is I, I actually think being involved in a workplace is very 
is good for people good for people to interact if they can if, if it allows that and make sure and not to be remote all the time all and always oh, and then of course we had with with remote working you're always on and should you be getting an email after 6 p.m at night i don't, don't i mean i think and i think i i think too we're in an era, era of um high high employment uh, a lot of people a lot of employers are looking for people to work for them so they, you can see already the workplace is mm -hmm. responding to this so they're um seeing consulting with the workers what do they want what they're recognizing that you know that money isn't everything and that job mm -hmm. satisfaction quality work recognition is important understanding and saying look you know you don't have to you, you you've, you've got a, a personal appointment that's fine go and do it and look after yourself uh, recognizing long term that as you say a healthy somebody who's healthy and happy in their workplace is far better <laughs> for long term mm -hmm. and I, I think like you can see employers are responding to that and there's lots of them yeah. um, there's lots of information around that now so I think yeah. I think on the whole the workplace should be safer now and should be a, a better better all around for, for for individuals yeah and George I'll, I'll invite you if you want to respond to that I was going to come back to you on something on uh relating to remote work in a moment. And I had another question on gender for Deirdre, but do you want to respond to, to Deirdre, George, and what you just said? Well, well just to, to say that I f fully agree with uh, with uh, Deirdre's comments there and to say that uh, with, in comparison with other areas of the world, with other regions of the world, it, the, it, the European Union does quite well in terms of health and safety at work. So we have a very strong uh, legislative um, key that allows you know to have the bare minimum applied you know, almost across the, the entire European Union. Uh, the things that we are talking about here in terms of job quality kind of goes a little bit beyond that. And it's it's more right. about those things that are harder to legislate, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this, this, these ideas of, for example, uh, having a meaningful job, we, which is very subjective, right? But people, if 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 what they do has kind of a strong meaning for them and they, if they uh, that would be kind of... Um, they put a bit more efforts and they are more engaged they are happier and so on and so forth so yeah. job satisfaction is higher if you are doing a job which you you know you have absolutely no relationship to you don't care it's just there to make a little bit of money to pay your bills at the end of the month that's not kind of a sustainable situation i would argue right so and these things are very hard how can you legislate uh, the meaningfulness yeah. of work you cannot right you this cannot, is no, but i'm saying it's, uh, it's it's coming it'll come organically you know from from workers demanding it and from work because leave, uh, they, they're not happy, they leave the job, and the yeah. employer won't, yeah. will be getting will get Absolutely. the message. And I yeah. recognise it's not all about health and safety. Yeah. That's that's a given. Yeah. But um, it's about it's about satisfaction, about being yeah. recognised, being appreciated, and having structures and predictable structures that you know you can be or exactly you know, you're not yeah. overburdened and. You, and very good. important as well is that we we allow and we promote the conversation between workers and employers as yeah. well because it's it, unfortunately it's still not the case everywhere there are still many workers who don't have access to any structures or trade unions or representatives at the workplace so uh, we are we are not too bad in europe but we could do better in that respect so that's mm -hmm. something that we should absolutely promote so that employers can understand better uh, workers preferences as well and can play a little bit around those preferences absolutely yeah. i think a word you just used deirdre um predictability is is really central to the challenges that a lot of people face in their employment both you know anecdotally but also in terms of the, of, of, of the data on, on a macro level people who are able to organize their working lives around a predict sorry their private lives around a predictable working life mm. and a predictable amount of income those who don't have that privilege life can be very difficult i yeah. i have a question just to put you deirdre and then i've um mm. I'll, I'll dip into the questions and answers then because there's actually there's quite a lot going on in there picking up on something you you brushed up against the idea of gender um deirdre in your opening remarks yeah do you think and and in what way uh, that the, the the digital revolution is or will be felt differently by people of different genders or indeed people of different socioeconomic classes at different intensities and in different ways? I don't know if you can share any of the discussions that have been had either in the group or, or in the committees that you're a member of regarding the impact of all we've been talking about on men and women and, and others. Well, I would think that the figures show that, that, that women are men are probably more have that have skills, the digital skills uh, before women. But I think uh, looking at figures like in terms of basic skills and skills to interact with um, e-government or forms and that women, women are better. But, but uh, you know, I, I, I think it's just it's a, it's a matter of education. It's a matter of from a work point of view, if we're talking about digital skills, technological skills, 
uh, we need to get more, more, more women in there. And the point I try to make is that you know, we, we're in an era of, um, of high employment. So we need women. We need women in the workforce. There's a vast talent, a pool talent out there, a pool of talent that we don't use. So we, 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 sh we should do that. But we need to uh, just generally address um, women and skills, uh, get, uh, upgrading them and getting them to t take up those kind of jobs where they need because yep. there, there are vacancies there but you know like anything it's like any area unless you have um, you need a balance you know mm -hmm. whether not just not just a gender but in um uh, diver diversity in all areas particularly in in, in uh, with those with disabilities and immigrants and uh, those those that are here for a short term so we need that that kind of a balance now but, and i think it, it's important if you're going to be a, a, an attractive if we want to attract people to work here we got to have uh, we've got to show that we're that in Ireland we're, that, that we're, we're diversified and it's open to everybody and that it's not just a one one type fits all it's not uh, so diversity in any areas is always yeah. important okay but bef George before I go to the um the questions and answers is there are there any patterns or anything in the data that you want to remark regarding gender or kind of any other profile that you think is of interest Yes, I, I think one of the things that we, we should remind ourselves, uh, apart from, of course, the, 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 the issues that were already mentioned, this, this uh, uh, gender segregation that we can see in sectors and occupations and so on, um, there's something which is kind of, uh, in my opinion, a bit more profound and that we have to, to address if we want to change things uh, in, in a good way. And that's the division of labor in terms of paid work and unpaid work. Because in our data, we can see that men spend more time in paid work than women do, but then women spend much more time than men in unpaid work. Unpaid work, I'm talking about um, you know, doing your house chores to care for children, care for uh, other members of the family and so on. And when you put all those figures together, women end up working many more hours per week than men do. Uh, on average, on average, the, the uh, average European uh, working woman works uh, eight, the equivalent of eight weeks full time more than men do. Mm -hmm. And this is just uh, incredible, okay. right? Yeah. So this is something that we have to break down and then we have to rebalance uh, in order to get women to be more participant, perhaps in, in, un in paid work than they already are, right? So when we think about yeah getting more women in uh, in the, the so-called STEM uh, sectors and occupations, we also have to uh, understand uh, what they are not doing or what are the reasons for their choice when they are looking for a job and so on and so forth. Because most of the times, unfortunately, still not these days, when women have children, they remove themselves for many, you know, for long periods of time from the labor market. And yeah. if we can rebalance that a little bit more, then perhaps things could be a bit different, uh, I would yeah. argue. Yeah, I just like to, if I could pick up on I that point, I, I think it's a very interesting topic. Um, and I know I know the figures that women do much more work uh, in unpaid work. Uh, but and it's it's in, in the, particularly when they're working themselves because they do the unpaid work as well. But I have I mean I don't know how you, you can't legislate for that. You cannot you tell cannot. people how to live. I, I I have a thing about the state coming behind your front door. You know if you want to mind the children all the time and clean all that. That's your that's your problem or that's your privilege. <laughs> I don't know or sweep the floor like you, you know. I think I think um, let's stay out of that and let people work that out for themselves. But recognize that we do have to support. Like childcare is important, caring of the elderly, because women just do so much more of that. And that you're right, that's what keeps them out of work. But leave leave the housework to let to let a couple sort that out themselves. I think because uh, you can't like don't, don't go there. You can't legislate for it. But um, it's an important point. Absolutely important point. And uh, I think it's going to be picked up further in the in the the, the Q and A. We're going to get through as many of them as we can in the kind of fifteen minutes that remain. And there's questions on innovation, on working time, on artificial intelligence, and more. I'm going to begin with a question from Dan O'Brien, our chief economist here at the IIEA. Hello, Dan. Thanks for being on the call. Dan says, the belief that innovation happened around the water cooler was uncontested before the pandemic, yet incredible innovation took place during lockdowns. What do the speakers think about the connection between being in the office and levels of innovation? I'll start with George first and then go to Deirdre. So the connections between being in the office and being innovative and being creative, George, you mentioned it briefly in your remarks. That's that's yeah, yeah that's a very interesting question. Thank you so much for that. Uh, 
what I can say is that from um, a recent uh, piece of research we have done around the idea of hybrid work. So hybrid work is a situation in which people have to work a little bit at the office or at the employer's premises and uh, from home with different, uh, let's say, uh, frequencies in both sides. But what we have seen there is that this, the different locations have different purposes or they can have different functions, right? Mm -hmm. So when you need your social support, when you need your uh, your partner, your colleague to you know exchange a few ideas from, or when you need to sit down with your supervisor or manager to discuss serious things, in principle, that should take place in the office. Um, when you're working from home, it's a different kind of uh, work. You can do deeper work. You're more focused in principle. Uh, of course, there can be distractions as well. And that was a complaint of people with, with families, with kids, for example, when, when kids were not in school. But in principle, if you can work from home with a certain type of uh, purpose, that would have a, a certain uh, type of, of function. So in relation to the idea of innovation, I believe that both locations can have um, a function in that you know, in that process of, of being creative and in, in, in innovation. It doesn't have to be necessarily at home or in the office. It's a mix of, of, of both. And let's see if, you know, we are conducting more uh, research on this uh, in practice. So we, we want to do some case studies with companies implementing hybrid workplaces. And we want to see to what extent creativity and innovation is functioning for them in this kind of model. So hopefully in the near future, we'll know a bit more about that. Right. Yeah. Deirdre, any thoughts? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, I, I I don't have the, the data, the research now that you're in it, but I would say uh, there's a mi mixture of both, obviously being at home and being able to concentrate is good. Uh, but nevertheless, I don't think you can uh, substitute for the brainstorming session. And when, when Dan mentioned there the water cooler moment, I was I'm reminded of this, we were of a story, we were down in BioNTech visiting, they were responsible for the vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, Pfizer BioNTech, and they were telling us the story of how they um, realized that their mRNA for, that they were developing for years uh, could be changed to can to from a cancer vaccine to a, a vaccine for um, for COVID, and it was it wasn't a water cooler moment; it was a coffee mo coffee station moment. But the same principles, so I don't think you can you can ever you can ever substitute for hu hu humans direct contact, that brainstorming, that bouncing of ideas, because. Like we're in a Zoom call now, or yeah, it's Zoom. It's, yeah, and uh, you, you know, you have your interest, but there's no, there'd be, if we were all sitting around a table, we'd be, I think the conversation would fl flow better. But, you know, mixture of both, absolutely. And it doesn't have to be, have to be nine to five, six, seven, eight days a week. It can, you can have a mixture. And that's, that's probably what we've learned. There's a good balance there. Absolutely. We can't get away from what I think you said at the outset, Deirdre, the fact that we're in, you know, discrete locations, the three of us with, with one of you were in different locations, the three of us, and obviously everybody on, on the call, where there's dozens and dozens of locations that yeah. there's obviously positives, positives and negatives, as I'm sure you'd agree. Yeah, absolutely. Going, going to, to, to shift gear, I think this is really interesting. There, there's a question from Stephanie Ryan. Uh, thank you for being on the call, Stephanie. And I have to say, I don't fully agree with the premise of the question, but I'll put it to you. Do you not think that no commuting times means that we can work a bit longer? three hours a day commuting saved when working from home, most people don't mind working a bit longer. I think I kind of muddled that a little bit. I'll, I'll try it again. Mm -hmm. You think that no commuting means that we can work a bit longer, yeah. uh, dot, dot, dot. Most people don't mind working a bit longer. I'll tag on to Stephanie's question. Thanks again, Stephanie. The question from Dylan Marshall, one of our researchers at the Institute. And Dylan noted that last month in May, Commissioner Schmidt, the, commission, uh, the, the European Commissioner for Jobs, called for an EU-wide four-day work week. Do you think that this is a desirable or possible? So there are the two questions. One from Stephanie about not commuting and maybe being able to actually work a bit more. And one from Dylan about whether we can move towards working less to a four-day week or maybe a restructured week, the same hours across four mm -hmm. days. Anything either in the data, George, you could speak about or in the politics, Deirdre, from your discussions in Parliament? Maybe starting with you first, Deirdre. Okay, I'm, I'm, well, on the commute, um, yeah, absolutely. If you're not sitting in a car, sitting on a train, or if you haven't that all that time, wasted <laughs> commuting and you can put it to work yeah but I, th I think then you know that's that isn't a matter of, that is a matter for the individual that's doing the work or for the employer mm -hmm. isn't it to, to build to build that into arrangement but yeah I mean as in like that it's um it's important to to, to sometimes to, you have to travel to be face to face but if you can spend the time 
working. I mean, I think it, it's, 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 it's courses for courses. There's some jobs, of course, which recognize in all this discussion that you can't like, that you cannot at all, but be in presence. And I, I think particularly of the healthcare sector, hospitality, those, we've, yeah. those face-to-face professionals. So I think they don't have any, they don't have any choice in it. And they still have the, the commuting time as well. Mm-hmm. Um, on, on Commissioner Schmidt's proposal for a four day week, working week, four day, I mean, we've seen a little bit of that in some companies already starting to move towards it. And I, I mean, I, I think, yes, as, as it becomes like jobs change, uh, if it's possible, yes. But there's again, some jobs you won't be able to do. You'd have to have hospitality, healthcare is the two that I've mentioned, um, food sector, uh, retail will have to be six yeah. or seven days a week. Um, but if I mean, I would think that there's lots of companies I know now have a shorter working week or even a half day Friday. If you work extra hours during the week, if you're, is, it, is, it, is it about the 40 hours? Is it about the, qu- the quantity of the hours or the quality of the hours? I think you can, again like that. Um, I would think it's a, it's a matter for, for individual for companies and for the, the contra- and, and employees and the, the job that they're taking. Good. Yeah, from from my side, in in relation to the reduction of commuting times, I mean that's obviously uh, an individual decision to do whatever they want with the, with their time. We looked at the the, however, at the effects in terms of emissions, so CO two emissions. Yeah. To what extent mm-hmm. this would kind of uh, reduce the emissions and the. Uh, it's inconclusive because basically if you stay at home you have to use energy anyway uh very likely you're kind of if you're by yourself in your household you are perhaps uh, not as efficient as being in an office in terms of you know when when it comes to heating or uh, use of, of of energy so it's 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 a bit in in principle we should see some reductions there but in terms of emissions obviously but um yeah, we don't see, we don't, the, the, yeah, there's no conclusion. There's no clear conclusion about uh, about this. In terms of, of the time usage, uh, I mean, depends on the individual, of course. It, if, if they decide to make use of that time to work more, that's their prerogative. But I would say that there are other things also interesting in life to, to do, and they can develop <laughs> themselves personally, you know, in other areas as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a matter of making a clever use of, of that time. In relation to the four-day work week, this is something which is being trialed at the moment. So there was a big trial in the UK and some of the, some of the results came out. Um, it's being trialed in other regions of the world, uh, in other continents as well. And uh, again, so far, what I have seen in terms of research or the reports that come out of these trials, uh, it's a bit biased because the, the there's a kind of uh, uh, some sort of process of self, self-selection of the companies involved. They tend to be small with younger people and so on. So it's kind of there's a predisposition, let's say, for this to be successful in a way. Um, whatever whatever happens is that we need to 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 check and to see if this is applicable to uh, because i suspect this is not applicable in many sectors in many cir- circumstances so it might be applicable in some in some areas of our economies but not certainly not to to everyone we are going to carry out um, in principle um a pilot project uh, looking at this so we will look specifically at some case studies as well some company uh, situations to see how far this you know, worked well and what are the challenges and benefits of such a model. From a research point of view, what is concerning for me is uh, the type of model that is uh, applicable. Because as Deirdre mentioned, uh, it's a, the matter of quality and quality type of mm-hmm. discussion, right? Because if you are uh, given 32 hours and you are requested to do the same things that you were doing before in 40, yeah. that might be an impossibility. So this means that your work intensity increase. And as I mentioned before, work intensity is one of those things that have a negative impact on your health. So in terms of sustainability, that not, doesn't work. If if you're asked to do the same things <laughs> in, a, in a smaller amount of time, so the pressure is on, that doesn't work. Uh, if it's a reduction of, of uh, hours accompanied by a reduction of the amount of things that you have to do, then that can that can work. Yeah, that sounds good actually. Um, there's real interest in in this discussion. There's a, a very um, significant number of questions, which is indicative, I think, of both the importance of this topic, but also of the the great presentations from the speakers. So maybe we should do this again in in, in a little while. Mm. I'm going to try and get to as many of these as I can. I'm going to start with I'm going to put two questions together. Uh, if I can find them here, one is from Joshua, and then the other one is from Shane. So, Joshua Elol, nice to have you here, Joshua. How do we ensure that the advancement of AI 
and the consequential increase in productivity benefits all does not further increase this, the expanding wealth gap. It seems to me that we could easily end up with widespread unemployment. That's from Joshua. You can, by, by all means, you can, you can acknowledge and sidestep any of these questions if you wish in the last couple of minutes. But if you have something to say about the kind of benefits of AI and how they're distributed, please do. And then another question from Seamus Allen, who is our um, digital researcher here at the Institute. The question he uh, put in regarding um, workplace surveillance. Can you comment on the use of surveillance technologies? Again, please sidestep this if you have nothing to say, but surveillance technologies in the workplace and how this should be regulated. Mm -hmm. Two kind of technical questions. I'll start with you, Deirdre, given your experience in AI. Okay. Yeah, well, experience. Yeah, um, Joshua, uh, the advancement of AI, yeah, this question is asked a lot. Uh, what does it mean for jobs? And, and the, the, then one of the counteracted arguments is that where well, we've seen the industrial revolution, we've been told the advancements of technology and digitalization that jobs would change and that it haven't, hasn't to that, that effect. Um, the, where productivity, yeah, your productivity is, is going to improve. Um, I don't know about, about your point about the income income gap widening, but I do think that it's a point I made, maybe that skills are going to be very important and upskilling and reskilling is very important because if you can't just, I mean, we can't have people just or just throwing our hands in the air and saying, oh, those jobs are gone. That's it. Let's, um, let's just support those people in social welfare. Whatever. We have to really work with them because they needed their productivity, their input will be needed. So. I, I can't. I, I can't. And no, I don't think anybody can answer definitively where where AI is going to take us, other, other than um, it's it's going to be here to stay, and we need to, mm -hmm. to manage it. As regards workplace surveillance, yeah, we've had the discussion, James, in, in our in our negotiations on this on this um, file. Uh, we do have major companies coming to say to you, say for instance, large warehouses that they need surveillance to make sure that the employers are okay and that they're not, um, you know, that they don't fall or hit their head, whatever, uh, I, I don't know. But I do think it has to be done that if you're employing somebody, or if, if you just say, look, you're going into an area that does have this surveillance. I think we need, that's that's where the legislation is looking at now that you would inform people and tell them, look, this is it, this is what we have here. It's there for there for your protection uh, as much as it is uh, for, for, for others that are, are for, your, for your co-workers. So in, in, in transparency and informing people is, is the way forward there. George, any views? Well, in relation to the last point on surveillance, I have little to say. Uh, I know that mm -hmm. some some of my colleagues are, are actually looking into this, and we will have a couple of projects uh, in the next four-year program period. So it's between 25 and 28, 2025 and 2028. So this is something that we will certainly have a look at in term, from a research point of view. There was some work on on the ethics uh, of, of, you know, digitalization and this uh, processes of monitoring and surveillance and so on. Uh, and there's a report about that. If you're interested, um, I can certainly mm -hmm. circulate that and people can have a look at mm -hmm. some of the legislation already available in some of the member states around these things. Um, and then I will have a go at the, the the wealth distribution associated with AI um, to say that perhaps the way of looking at this is through the value of work, right? So there are many uh, occupations and jobs which will be required in the future. And I'm thinking about health and care. Those jobs in principle, great deal of those jobs cannot be substituted by AI. Um, there's always a, a human aspect uh, element to it. So it's a, a matter of um, how do we value our work and uh, therefore how work is rewarded from a monetary point of view. And then I think the other way of looking at it is through the fiscal policy. So, and put in perspective, the type of income tax that we have versus the corporate tax, because if there's income which is produced with no use of uh, uh, humans, so uh, with no use of a workforce, then perhaps that kind of income should be taxed in a different way because it's produced in a different way. So uh, basically I'm kind of hinting here that perhaps uh, everything that is produced with the with the use of you know human power <laughs> to some extent should be taxed differently and valued differently than it perhaps is at the moment. Hmm. George, thank you. We're going to say something later. No, I'm just saying that that's an interesting approach, but I absolutely agree. Like healthcare in areas such as that, that they cannot be replaced by AI. Indeed. So, um, and, and of course, AI will always have to be used. Not always, but it must be used with the human of human oversight as well. So when you, you use, use AI in conjunction uh, with work, that's, that's important. And the understanding of that and the able to AI literacy and be able to interact mm. will be important in terms of the skills requirement. Well, certainly.
Thank you, Deirdre. I didn't even get to come back to you, George, on, on the questions that myself and others had had about remote work. So perhaps that's that's a signal that we, we should do something again. And indeed, on artificial, sorry, on, on workplace surveillance, uh, it would be, be great to kind of regroup um, in the future just to discuss some of the really important and pressing issues that have been raised here. Because as I said, there's been a huge amount of interest in what you've said. I apologize to Kevin Empey, who had a question on ESG, and Gail Fitzgerald, who, who, who had a remark about unpaid labor. I'll, I'll pass on the details of both okay. remarks to, to the speaker so, that, so they know what, what you have people thinking about. But uh, it's been really, really enjoyable. I, I just want to thank our two speakers, Deirdre Clune and George Cabrita, for a really stimulating, uh, stimulating discussion I'll be thinking about for the rest of the day and the week, I think. And also just, just to acknowledge Patrick O'Reardon and, uh, and colleagues at the European Parliament Liaison Office for this partnership and for, for kind of coming up with this idea to organize, the, organize these webinars in conjunction this year and last year. They've been really enjoyable. And I think on each occasion, there's been a really rich and, and important discussion. And as we lead up to the European Parliament elections that I'm sure are on Deirdre's and, and other minds uh, over the next couple of months, th these sorts of discussions only become more and more important. So just want to thank our speakers, thank Patrick O'Riordan and colleagues at the European Parliament Liaison Office, Dylan Marshall from my team for organizing this and, and other colleagues, and most importantly, those at home who, who, who listened and who contributed so um, so keenly to the discussion. So thanks everybody for your time and look forward to doing this again. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks so much.